Second part of chapter 7 of the first volume of The Life of Reason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fredrik Karlsson. The Life of Reason by George Santayana. Side note. So-called abstractions complete facts. These arrested and recognizable ideas, concretions of similars succeeding one another in time, are not abstractions, but they may come to be regarded as such after the other kind of concretions in experience, concretions of superposed perceptions in space, have become the leading objects of attention. The sensuous material for both concretions is the same, the perception which, recurring in different objects otherwise not retained in memory, gives the idea of roundness, is the same perception which helps to constitute the spatial concretion called the sun. Roundness may therefore be carelessly called an abstraction from the real object sun, whereas the peculiar optical and muscular feelings by which the sense of roundness is constituted probably feelings of gyration and perpetual unbroken movement, are much earlier than any solar observations. They are a self-sufficing element in experience, which, by repetition in various accidental contests, has come to be recognized and named, and to be a characteristic by virtue of which more complex objects can be distinguished and defined. The idea of the sun is a much later product, and the real sun is so far from being an original datum from which roundness is abstracted, that it is an ulterior and quite ideal construction, a spatial concretion into which the logical concretion roundness enters as a prior and independent factor roundness may be felt in the dark by a mere suggestion of motion and is a complete experience in itself when this recognizable experience happens to be associated by contiguity with other recognizable experiences of heat light height and yellowness and these various independent objects are projected into the same portion of a real space, then a concretion occurs, and these ideas being recognized in that region and finding a momentary embodiment there become the qualities of a thing. A conceived thing is doubly a product of mind, more a product of mind, if you will, than an idea, since ideas arise, so to speak, by the mind's inertia and conceptions of things by its activity. Sidenote. Things concretions of concretions. Ideas are mental sediment. Conceived things are mental growths. A concretion in discourse occurs by repetition and mere emphasis on a datum, but a concretion in existence requires a synthesis of disparate elements and relations. An idea is nothing but a sensation apperceived and rendered cognitive, so that it envisages its own recognized character as its object and ideal. Yellowness is only some sensation of yellow raised to the cognitive power and employed as the symbol for its own specific essence. It is consequently capable of entering as a term into rational discourse and of becoming the subject or predicate of propositions eternally valid. A thing, on the contrary, is discovered only when the order and grouping of such recurring essences can be observed, and when various themes and strains of experience are woven together into elaborate progressive harmonies. When consciousness first becomes cognitive, it frames ideas, but when it becomes cognitive of causes, that is, when it becomes practical, it perceives things. Side note. 
ideas prior in the order of knowledge, things in the order of nature. Concretions of qualities recurrent in time and concretions of qualities associated in existence are alike involved in daily life and inextricably ingrown into the structure of reason in consciousness and for logic association by similarity with its aggregations and identifications of recurrences in time is fundamental rather than association by contiguity and its existential synthesis for recognition identifies similars perceived in succession and without recognition of similars there could be no known persistence of phenomena but physiologically and for the observer association by contiguity comes first all instinct without which there would be no fixity or recurrence in ideation makes movement follow impression in an immediate way which for consciousness becomes a mere juxtaposition of sensations a juxtaposition which it can neither explain nor avoid yet this juxtaposition in which pleasure pain and striving are prominent factors is the chief stimulus to attention and spreads before the mind that moving and variegated field in which it learns to make its first observations facts the burdens of successive moments are all associated by contiguity from the first facts of perception and passion to the last facts of fate and conscience we undergo events we grow into character by the subterraneous working of irrational forces that make their incalculable eruptions into life none the less wonderfully in the revelations of a man's heart to himself than in the cataclysms of the world around him nature's placid procedure to which we yield so willingly in times of prosperity is a concatenation of states which can only be understood when it is made its own standard and law a sort of philosophy without wisdom may seek to subjugate this natural life this blind budding of existence to some logical or moral necessity but this very attempt remains perhaps the most striking monument to that rational fatality that rules affairs a monument which reason itself is compelled to raise with unsuspected irony side note aristotle's compromise reliance on external perception constant appeals to concrete facts and physical sanctions have always led the mass of reasonable men to magnify concretions in existence and belittle concretions in discourse they are too clever as they feel to mistake words for things the most authoritative thinker on this subject because the most mature aristotle himself taught that things had reality individuality independence and were the outer causes of perception while general ideas products of association by similarity existed only in the mind the public pleased at its ability to understand this doctrine and overlooking the more incisive part of the philosopher's teaching could go home comforted and believing that material things were primary and perfect entities while ideas were only abstractions effects those realities produced on our incapable minds aristotle however had a juster view of general concepts and made in the end the whole material universe gravitate around them and feel their influence though in a metaphysical and magic fashion to which a more advanced natural science need no longer appeal while in the shock of life man was always coming upon the accidental in the quiet of reflection he could not but recast everything in ideal moulds and retain nothing but eternal natures and intelligible relations 
aristotle conceived that while the origin of knowledge lay in the impact of matter upon sense its goal was the comprehension of essences and that while man was involved by his animal nature in the accidents of experience he was also by virtue of its rationality a participator in eternal truth a substantial justice was thus done both to the conditions and to the functions of human life although for want of a natural history inspired by mechanical ideas this dualism remained somewhat baffling and incomprehensible in its basis aristotle being a true philosopher and pupil of experience preferred incoherence to partiality side note empirical bias in favour of contiguity active life and the philosophy that borrows its concepts from practice has thus laid a great emphasis on association by contiguity hobbes and locke made knowledge of this kind the only knowledge of reality while recognizing it to be quite empirical tentative and problematical it was a kind of acquaintance with fact that increased with years and brought the mind into harmony with something initially alien to it besides this practical knowledge of prudence there was a sort of verbal and merely ideal knowledge a knowledge of the meaning and relation of abstract terms in mathematics and logic we might carry out long trains of abstracted thought and analyze and develop our imaginations ad infinitum these speculations however were in the air or what for those philosophers is much the same thing in the mind their applicability and their relevance to practical life and to objects given in perception remain quite problematical a self-developing science a synthetic science a priori had a value entirely hypothetical and provisional its practical truth dependent on the verification of its results in some eventual sensible experience association was invoked to explain the adjustment of ideation to the order of external perception association by which association by contiguity was generally understood thus became the battle cry of empiricism if association by similarity had been equally in mind the philosophy of pregnant reason could also have adopted the principle for its own but logicians and mathematicians naturally neglect the psychology of their own processes and accustomed as they are to an irresponsible and constructive use of the intellect regard as a confused and uninspired intruder the critic who by a retrospective and naturalistic method tries to give them a little knowledge of themselves Side note artificial divorce of logic from practice rational ideas must arise somehow in the mind and since they are not meant to be without application to the world of experience it is interesting to discover the point of contact between the two and the nature of their interdependence this would have been found in the mind's initial capacity to frame objects of two sorts those compacted of sensations that are persistently similar and those compacted of sensations that are momentarily fused in empirical philosophy the applicability of logic and mathematics remains a miracle or becomes a misinterpretation a miracle if the process of nature independently follows the inward elaboration of human ideas a misinterpretation if the bias of intelligence imposes a priori upon reality a character and order not inherent in it the mistake of empiricists among which kant is in this respect to be numbered which enabled them to disregard this difficulty was that they admitted beside rational thinking another instinctive kind of wisdom by which men could live a wisdom the englishmen called experience and the germans practical reason spirit or will 
the intellectual sciences could be allowed to spin themselves out in abstracted liberty while man practised his illogical and inspired art of life here we observe a certain elementary crudity or barbarism which the human spirit often betrays when it is deeply stirred not only are chance and divination welcomed into the world but they are reverenced all the more like the wind and fire of idolaters precisely for not being amendable to the petty rules of human reason in truth however the english duality between prudence and science is no more fundamental than the german duality between reason and understanding footnote a this distinction in one sense is platonic but plato's reason was distinguished from understanding which dealt with phenomenal experience because it was a moral faculty defining those values and meanings which in platonic nomenclature took the title of reality the german reason was only imagination substituting a dialectical or poetic history of the world for its natural development german idealism accordingly was not like plato a moral philosophy hypostasized but a false physics adored the true contrast is between impulse and reflection instinct and intelligence when men feel the primordial authority of the animal in them and have little respect for a glimmering reason which they suspect to be secondary but cannot discern to be ultimate they readily imagine they are appealing to something higher than intelligence when in reality they are falling back on something deeper and lower the rudimentary seems to them at such moments divine and if they conceive a life of reason at all they despise it as a mass of artifices and conventions reason is indeed not indispensable to life nor needful if living anyhow be the sole and indeterminate aim as the existence of animals and of most men sufficiently proves in so far as man is not a rational being and does not live in and by the mind in so far as his chance volitions and dreamful ideas roll by without mutual representation or adjustment in so far as his body takes the lead and even his galvanized action is a form of passivity we may truly say that his life is not intellectual and not dependent on the application of general concepts to experience for he lives by instinct End of chapter 7, part 2